Hello. Um, I work at an inner city elementary school, urban community school, and we do a lot of work at 49th and Lorraine trying to provide access for our families to just the products you're talking about. There are several challenges. Rare to find a supermarket in the neighborhood, and in terms of the farmer's markets, they don't accept WIC or food stamps. Are there um, any things that you see on the horizon that can help get access for my families to the food you're talking about? Mary Holmes, you want to um, take that first? Yeah, what neighborhood are you in? Ohio City. Okay. Um, the Tremont Farmer's Market does do electronic benefit transfer, and many markets are moving more in that direction. It has definitely been a priority of the USDA Farmer's Market Promotion Program. Um, I know there are also some uh, neighborhood CSAs that perhaps your family's, uh, the City Fresh program is over on the west side. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeff Heinen, can you talk about the, the dynamics uh, regarding uh, su opening supermarkets in inner city neighborhoods and why that's such a challenge? Uh, I guess speak from our own personal perspective. I mean, one of the challenges is supermarkets have become extraordinarily expensive places. Uh, a typical 40,000 square foot supermarket is about $10 million, not counting the land and the inventory. And so it's a big investment. And so the reality is, is then for Heinen's, is it's not only a big investment as a small company, we can't afford too many mistakes along those lines, as well as that if you were to build a different format, uh, you know, we're grocers, we're kind of can stick with one model and follow that model. So I think it's a combination of the level of money that's required uh, and the fact that it requires a certain amount of, of population to support it in order to make money. Because as we've learned the hard way is that it's easy to, if you can write the check for $10 million, writing the check to lose a million dollars a year is a lot tougher. Um, and so it, it just, it's, it's, it's a risky proposition. And, you know, I am a believer that, you know, people will build things where, um, where they can make money. And the challenge is a little bit of, of education that we talked about, is will people eat fruits and vegetables um, and be able to provide that? Will they buy it? And, and so it's the chicken or the egg a little bit. And that's where government could help. Because they could be the chicken. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, I, I'm curious. I guess it's a whole nother uh, luncheon, but we didn't touch upon meat and meat products. Um, and lately, you've been hearing a lot about uh, how that's grown in the big places. Um, one question, I'll, <clears throat> pardon me, I'll get to that, is about meat fillers. I'd like to ask Jeff, by the way, thank you all for participating today. I think it's been great. Um, but I'd like to ask Jeff if uh, Heinen's does all their own butchering or do they import a lot? And the whole thing with the uh, ground beef, for instance, do you use a lot of filler? And when it says so much percent fat, is it just fat or is there that filler stuff we've been hearing about? Yeah, well, I mean, for Heinen's, we certainly, there's no filler. Um, all of our animals, whether it's chicken or beef, pork, they don't uh, eat anything but grain or grass, uh, and so, uh, at least in our case, you know, animal byproducts as part of the feed isn't something that is an issue. Uh, in terms of, um, what was the first point that? The uh, Yeah, I mean, Heinen's is, again, I, we spent a lot of time on sourcing, and so uh, we buy from two specific um, organizations, which is really a collection of ranchers, because again, uh, the average rancher in this country is 350 head of cattle. Uh, it's not very big. And so uh, f to supply even someone as small as us is we need a collection of ranchers to supply us meat. But we do it in a way that's very prescribed. So you know, basically the way our system is set up is that we tell them, um, it's really, f as we say, from, you know, it's from birth to retail counter, is that what they're, f fed, actually how they're bred, what they're fed, 
um, and, how, and then to how they're slaughtered. And we use smaller slaughterhouses that we believe have the right control. So we believe we have great sources of product. Call that from calf to cutlet. Okay, after cutlet. <laughs> Doug. Um, I would like to say it, one of the last changes that we've made at FIRE is to switch our meat program over as much as we can. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do. Even for a restaurant like ours, you know, we are so small and we could not get enough supply to have it as a consistent feature on our menu. About a year ago, we switched to grass-fed beef uh, for our hamburger from Miller Livestock. And they have been so supportive of us because they are sort of teaching us how to utilize the product and what to offer and when they have something available. And we really test market it in the restaurant and try it. And we try and use a whole cow as much as we can. And right now we're using the grass-fed beef burger. We're actually starting to put a rib steak on the menu to try and utilize that. And just slowly but surely, the more you use the product, the more you know how to use it and, and cost-effectively also. How much meat are you going through in a week? Um, let's see, how much meat are we going through in a week? I would say... You know, that's a good question. I would say at least uh, 150 pounds of, of meat. But, I mean, in terms of burger, it's probably 50 pounds or uh -huh. something like that. Jeff, how many pounds do you sell a week? <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of pounds. Hundreds of thousands of pounds of beef, just of beef. beef. Right. Okay, our next question. I think it's over here. Thank you uh, for being here. My question is two-pronged. One is it's about support of how the consumer be, can be more knowledgeable and what are resources that we can utilize to not only support you in three very distinct roles, but also to better educate ourselves and what are best practices in pur for purchasing? Mary Holmes, you start. I'll start because I think that the farmer's market is really uh, the kind of entry point and, and the, uh, the place where there's a lot of experimentation and uh, opportunity to learn about things like grass-fed beef and post, uh, pastured poultry and uh, if you buy uh, actual pastured eggs at the market from somebody uh, you know, um, it's hard to buy eggs in the store after that. So, but, but it does help educate you by actually having the experience of um, ha trying foods that have been raised locally and picked ripe and uh, all the methods that, that we really would like to see. Um, <clears throat> but I think there's lots to read, of course, on this, many books uh, and, and films. Um, and I, I want to say I think we are extremely fortunate to have Heinen's in our community because the consolidation of grocery business you probably know these numbers better than I, but it's something like four retail companies own 80, 70 percent, no? What is it? Uh, probably four, maybe 40 percent. 40 percent? Yeah. Still a very large yeah, percentage. And that kind of consolidation makes it much more difficult to have an impact. So I think, uh, I think Heinen's has been extremely responsive to customers who have come and asked for uh, better products, for raised products differently. Um, and uh, I think we're very fortunate, certainly in the restaurant world, uh, we have many restaurants now in greater Cleveland that are trying to focus on this. Doug, talk about how many in your group in the Cleveland independents who are, who are really focusing on local sourcing. 